I was in my first semester of university. I had just graduated college not too long ago, and had entered into a program that after a while I would come to resent. During that time with adjusting and taking daily transit an hour and a half away from where I grew up into the big city in order to study was somewhat of a new adventure to me. In a lot of ways, I was just beginning to sprout as my own individual and trying to carve a path for my life while simultaneously opening myself up to new experiences and a new environment. I have longtime friends who go to the same facility as me, but at the time, our schedules wouldn't always line up. This meant a lot of my days were spent traveling back and forth and walking around the city alone. I really wanted to try and expand my horizon of experiences and friends during this period. In a lot of ways, I was really desiring to find a good community on campus that could help satiate my boredom and loneliness. I can be extremely extroverted, but sometimes I find that it takes a lot out of me to try and actually pursue and maintain friendships that haven't been established years prior. I've made friends before from different classes in college, but ultimately, I would end up texting less and less until eventually either side would end up ghosting one or the other. Because I'm a busy guy, I don't find myself prioritizing people who I feel aren't as important to me as others. I know, a shitty thing to say, but nonetheless true. One day, I met Joel. I was on the phone with my fiancé, and I distinctively remember exactly how it all went down. As I was walking out of the school Starbucks with the decaf coffee, I had one earphone in, and I was heading to class through a small stretch of underground passageway under the street that connects the school's library building to the actual building that possesses classes. As I was hastily making my way, I saw this short and stout guy, looking roughly my age at the time, with a thick brown beard and a hat on. Our eyes met, and as I was about to simply walk past, he asked me something in a very charismatic and calm tone. Hey, sorry to bother you. You look like a pretty busy guy. But I was wondering, do you mind doing a study about religion? It's for one of my classes. To this, I regret answering and wish I'd simply continued walking. But at the time, I was becoming more and more compelled by the notion of formal religious institutions and questioning my own religious faith, particularly leaning towards Christianity. Sure. I replied cordially. He then introduced himself as Joel, and after we went through a small survey pertaining to religious affiliations and perspectives on religions, Joel informed me that a small group of students like himself were planning on getting together as a group and discussing various religions in order to gather new insights and to create a community. Of course, with the prospect of finding some new friends on campus and also exploring my own spiritual perspectives, I gave him my phone number after he asked for it, and he said that he would contact me in the next following days. Upon entering our first meeting, I sat down in a very crowded place with seats at our school facility and was greeted by Joel alongside a bunch of other members. They introduced themselves to me and vice versa, and they were all extremely kind to me. We began our small group meeting and I was a bit shocked to find out that the sole topic that we were to discuss was Christianity. I wasn't aware that we were only going to be discussing Christianity, which was against what he had proposed this group to constitute upon our meeting in the tunnel. That being said, I was still curious enough to continue, and I was accompanied by three other young guys of my age, who after a bit of talking with, I found out we had a lot of similar interests. Joel who now presented himself as a leader of our study group, relayed how we would be analyzing Christianity through a multi-step program designed to unveil holy power associated with religion to us. Since I was curious and wanted to learn more about the religion as well as having made some newfound friends, I continued to attend this study group for the rest of the semester, in which there were a few circumstances where I questioned Joel's interpretations and was met with hard resistance. It felt like at times my wavering belief in what Joel was saying would be met with straight dismissal as opposed to actual conversation. I continued to brush that off as the group I was working with got closer. The school's club, which I was now a part of, 
provided me with exactly what I had wanted. We even went to a church-run event together where I quit vaping and many individuals reported mystical experiences. Things only started to get concerning with Joel during our one-on-one -on -one conversations. I discussed my personal experiences and belief in my newfound religious beliefs and all of my former spiritual experiences as well and Joel exposed me to a story and a few incidences that at the time I definitely should have taken as red flags. For example, when he was younger he'd gone on a retreat where when he was in prayer he said that he began to hear the voice of God talk to him. I questioned at first if he was referring to the voice of God as more so a metaphor but he reassured me that he literally heard God speak to him before. When he told me this, I became a bit unnerved. At the helm of this community was Joel, but in all other senses, I was satisfied with who I was with and what we were doing together. Though I'm not entirely dismissive of strange occurrences, especially pertaining to spirituality, his experience talking with God in his head came off as uncomfortable for me. He also said that the way he would pray would involve a direct conversation and reply with God. Out of discomfort, I wouldn't prod him on what he meant by this. This, of course, was just the beginning. After the summer had ended, I had found myself in the most religiously devoted state I'd ever been in. Throughout the summer, I had a treacherous injury which made me housebound for months, and to call upon God in a lot of ways for strength. With my newfound devotion, I was elated to fall back into the community that I had nurtured and grown with throughout the last semester, relating to something that I'd found deep joy in. At the first lesson of the semester, something was very different. Joel, as before, was at the helm of our study session, but was now perpetually interrupted by people coming to greet him and give him praise. It was so bad that we literally essentially sat and watched for 20 minutes before we can get on with our lesson, as more than 10 people, mostly young men of our age, came to greet this man. As aforementioned, when not unnerving, he was extremely charming and gave the impression that he cared deeply for everyone. Once our lesson began, he introduced us to the second phase of the program. He explained that this was one of the toughest programs of the different levels that there were, as it required even more devotion and, more importantly, an emphasis on sacrifice for those who engaged. He showed us a diagram of a stick person, and he showed that in this program we would have to accept Jesus as the center of our life. He explained by making our lives around Jesus entirely that we would not be losing something but be gaining. He also began to go over the notion that sex before marriage is a sin and that if we were to continue this program, we would have to make the sacrifice of giving up sex in our relationships and prove that we weren't. He said that many guys weren't able to continue because of it. I talked about this afterwards with one of the members of this group, who not unlike me had been in a serious relationship with someone they loved for years. In my personal opinion, though we weren't married on the altar, I knew that both me and this other member felt devoted to our partners, as if we were already married in a sense, and we both expressed how Joel's behavior surrounding this was off-putting, controlling, and intrusive. After our lesson, I was a bit dumbfounded by the intensity with which he gave his speech about this new program that we would be engaging in this semester. Joel and I sat down for a few more minutes and talked in which I expressed experiences of devotion from the summer and explained my entire catastrophic experience with my injury. He then went on to tell me that at times he was actually able to know things beforehand. This seemingly random and strange statement shocked me. He said, for example, he was able to know something another member had done before they had even mentioned it, and in the way that he described it, it sounded as if he was saying he had some form of mystical foresight. I was a bit jarred to say the least, though I felt like I would be impolite to question any further. Joel then went on to tell me that he believed that I, if I successfully completed this program, was primed to become a teacher for the first program I'd done the semester prior, leading others who would join, and that I had a bright future in the organization. In that moment, with what he'd laid down on us in the lesson, 
I felt overwhelmed by his expectations of me. It also became evident that Joel was not a student at our facility. In fact, he was in his mid-thirties and had kids. He was actually just a part of an organization that recruits people to become Christians and missionaries that work on our campus. This means that he actually lied to me when I first met him. He wasn't a student, there was no group talking about various religions, and his whole purpose was to convert me to make me join the organization he was a part of. At this point, school began to pick up a lot, and I was also working part-time to help support myself. As I was on the train to head back home the next week, I'd forgotten that my second lesson of the program that semester was supposed to happen, so I texted Joel saying, Hey man, I actually got onto the train and forgot about our lesson. Sorry about that dude, I'm not going to be able to make it as I have to work later. To which he replied, Can you get off the train? Try and get here as soon as possible. I was a bit dumbfounded at this question. Since I live an hour and a half away, it wasn't as easy as getting off the train and heading back the opposite direction, and he knew that. He knew the area I live in is remote and a long distance away. I also told him that I had to work, which he plainly disregarded. No man, unfortunately I can't come. Have a good lesson, I replied. To which he said again, Come on man, just get off the train and come back. At this point, I was annoyed. Not only did I feel like he was commanding me, but that he was also blatantly disregarding the fact that I had said no and that I had to work that day. I did not answer him. I talked with my fiancé about how I was starting to feel about the whole ordeal and how I felt guilty about having feelings of wanting to distance myself from the group while simultaneously not wanting to lose the community and friends that I'd established along the way. My fiancé told me that by the way that Joel was acting, and with regards to the things he said, that she was starting to become uncomfortable with the whole situation. I remember sitting in bed, thinking about leaving the group, and how the prospect made me feel physically ill. After all, I'd been given everything I wanted in the community, except at the helm was a seemingly increasingly controlling and persuasive being who was making me and possibly other members more miserable. There was an event the following Friday that was going to be at the church which was organized by the community. Originally, since many of my friends from this group were going, I intended to go, but alas, I was scheduled by my boss to work that day, so there was no way I was going to be able to attend. I knew that Joel would be insistent upon me coming anyways, so when Joel texted me reminding me that the event was Friday, I told him that I wasn't able to go because I had to work. To this, he replied and simply said, What? Bro, no way. You've gotta come. Take work off and find somebody to take your shift. God wants you there. I was expected. He dismissed my decision and also said that I had to be there because God wanted me there, as if he was his mouthpiece. I went on to text him again and inform him, No, sorry man, I can't do that. I just got a promotion and I have to be there. I hope you guys have a great time anyways. To which he then again replied similarly to what he had before. This was my personal breaking point. He knew the importance of my financial situation, and his dismissal of my personal boundaries, as well as his commanding, made me decide to text him, explaining that I was done with the group, and that I wanted to pursue my own religious exploration without the group from then on. I felt as if he was slowly but surely increasingly controlling me, and trying to take what he could, commanding me as if he were the leader of my life in any possible way. It was even up to him if I could fuck my fiancé, he replied with a long paragraph, persisting in this sort of overly kind manner that I had to continue with the group, and that it was God's will for me to show up to this event, even though I was completely unable. He was certain that this group was meant for me, and that God had told him that this was where I was supposed to be. After I responded again, telling him to stop, and that I would not, he sent me another paragraph of similar length, repeating what he would say. No matter what I would say and whenever I would say no, he would overstep my boundaries while maintaining a kind and friendly tone in order to try and push me into submission 
when I had clearly said no. At this point I said I did not want him to talk to me anymore, to which he replied, Bro, why? Can we meet up? With a smiley face. I want you to explain why you don't want to continue, bro, so we can meet up and do that, and I can get a better sense and we can figure out what we do from there, he continued. Even at this, I knew that he was trying to elongate his chance at bringing me back into the group and continuing his reign of control. I said I didn't want to, so we asked again. I decided at that moment that I needed to block him. So, I did. A semester later, I was walking down the street of my school, and as I walked by a pizza parlor, lo and behold, who came out? Joel walked over to me with one of his friends and said that I was one of his friends to his buddy. I uncomfortably stood there and his friend went inside for a moment while Joel turned around to look at me, and he asked with disarming gentleness, Did you block me? Yes, I replied. You should unblock me. That way we can meet up and talk, because I really want to know why you left the group, he said. To which I evidently was frustrated, said, Okay, and went on my way. That night, he messaged me on my Instagram, insisting we meet up again. I blocked him on there too. In short, I'm thankful for my fiancé, who's the love of my life. Without her, I'm not sure I would have been strong enough to have left the group and his control. The fact of the matter was that there were other guys in that group who had absolutely nobody. They had nothing, and they were prime targets for a charismatic and controlling freak. There were members of that group who were in higher levels, so to speak, who'd done all the programs, who seemed as if they were emaciated, but they had become such restricted fundamentalists that their lives and their openness to new experiences were significantly thwarted. Beware of who you let into your life, and just because somebody is nice to you does not mean that they might not have ulterior motives. Also, learn to stand your ground and respect yourself. If you say no, mean it. So Joel, you controlling cult leader, let's not meet again. I'm 19 years old and living far from home in a studio room. I'm often up late and last week I was doing some laundry at around 11pm-ish. I saw a man sitting in the lobby. I saw him around a bit at night, but I didn't think much of it. I'm in the laundry room. I just put my clothes in a dryer, and I hear the laundry room door beeping. It meant someone was coming in. There was the man, standing there with no clothes to watch, just staring at me. I maneuvered around him and headed to the lift. He followed me quickly and cornered me and asked for my Snapchat. I was tired and just wanted to get back to my room, so I stupidly gave it to him. I figured he'd message and try to flirt. I'd say, I have a boyfriend, sorry if you thought this was anything else, and that would be the end of it. So I'm about 5 foot 4 with very long red hair, and I'm half Indian English with Afghanistani descent. So I'm white passing, but kind of exotic, but people tend to stare at me. Anyway, he starts messaging me. It's kind of normal, then he starts saying weird stuff like, I saw you a month ago and I was impressed. I've been visiting a friend and staying here. And I've been watching you. I noticed that you come out mostly at night. He told me that he was Saudi Arabian and only visiting for five more days. Then it gets worse. He says, I love you, I can't help it. And then I say I have a boyfriend and he says, I only want you. And continues to completely ignore that. He asks to come to my room and I said no. Then he wanted a hug. He asked me if I lived alone and if I was a virgin. He kept saying he loved me and that I was perfect for him, that I impressed him. At that point, I recorded all the messages on Snapchat 
spoke to him a bit more to gather evidence so I could take it to the reception in the morning. He's been watching me for a month. I got my guy friend who lives on the second floor to walk me down to the laundry room. We sat in the student lounge area and my friend calmed me down. I was shaking with adrenaline and fear. We saw him around the laundry room again looking for me, but luckily I'd already picked up my stuff. I ran back to my room and my friend says that I can stay in his room, but I said it's okay, I'll just lock my door. It's about 1am and I hear someone outside my room trying to get in. I ask my friend if he's outside my room and he said no, so I just froze. I didn't want to make a sound. I felt sick to my stomach and helpless. Eventually it stopped and whoever it was went away. In the morning I reported this to reception and then went to stay a few days with my boyfriend then after went to London to visit a friend. And last night was the first time I'd spent a night in my room since this happened. I'm very paranoid now. Sadly, I should probably be used to this. It's not the first time I've been sexually harassed. One guy tried to kiss me in a club by grabbing my head, and a bunch of other things have happened that I won't go into here. But anyway, I'm terrified to go outside my room after dark. I'm constantly looking over my shoulder and feeling paranoid. I just keep blaming myself for being too nice, and I know it's my long thick hair that attracts people's eyes to me. I just want to cut it all off. Has anyone else had a similar experience? How did you deal with it? Oh, and reception still hasn't updated me on if he's still in the building. This was my second year at university. Late at night after hitting the bars, my two roommates and I were heavily intoxicated. An acquaintance asked me if an acquaintance of his could spend the night at our house, as his friend was from out of town and too drunk to drive home. No problem for us, as we considered ourselves stand-up guys, and had plenty of room and a comfy couch for him to sleep on. Our guest introduced himself, but asked that we call him Bullwinkle, as this was his preferred nickname. No problem again. I'm not sure if it's relevant, but before I passed out that evening, my girlfriend stopped by and we had sex. She left shortly after. The only reason I mention it is because from where Bullwinkle was sleeping, it had to be obvious that was what was happening. He must have heard us or been aware so I eventually pass out in bed alone. Very early in the morning, I was half woken to the sensation of someone tugging at my underwear, basically being pulled down in a way that must have exposed everything. Half drunk and barely conscious, I sat up and said something like, What the hell? I sort of half registered Bullwinkle quickly leaving my bedside and quietly throwing himself to the floor, hands over his head. Not being truly conscious, I stared at Bullwinkle lying in a heap on the floor for a while, not truly comprehending the situation. I then lay back down for a second. I'm not sure if I went back to sleep, but I was wide awake after I heard the front door slam. Wide awake and finally beginning to comprehend the situation. I paced the house for a couple of minutes, checked that the doors were locked and other security measures. I confirmed that Bullwinkle had left the building, then woke up my roommates. My roommates also noticed that their underwear was pulled down too. Sheets and blankets were pulled back. Dresser drawers were left open. Underwear was missing. All sorts of creepy stuff. We talked a bit about what to do. We searched for Bullwinkle, discussed calling the police, but rejected that idea partly out of how embarrassing that conversation might be, partly because none of us were hurt and nothing valuable taken. I tried calling my acquaintance, but no one answered, so we all went back to bed. No one ever heard from Bullwinkle again. His friends say that he disappeared abruptly. So, if you are out there, Bullwinkle, 
Fuck you. I didn't go to uni, but my best friend Tessa did, so of course I wanted to go to her housewarming party after I hadn't seen her in so long. I drove to her new house and met her early so we could go out for dinner and pick up some cheap alcohol and mixers for later. When we got to the house, I was introduced to some of her new housemates for the first time and picked a seat on this rusty brown sofa that looked like a dog chew toy. It wasn't glamorous, but Tess was so excited for her two worlds to collide. A little bit of awkwardness later, I realized I'm the only new person and everyone already knows each other. The house slowly fills with people, drinks are poured and the volume is rising on the speakers. For a bit of backstory, I'm in a career where I have an extended DBS check at all times and cannot have anything on my criminal record not even a driving offense. I don't really know anyone, and after coming back from the bathroom, I can't find my friend. I don't really know the house that well, so I go upstairs to look for her. As I get to the first bedroom, I'm welcomed in by a crowd of shrieking girls who want to compliment my hair and my nails and, oh my god, I love your eye makeup. I ask them if they've seen Tessa, and they say no. As I turn to leave, I'm blocked by these three guys leaning over a dresser, doing lines of coke. I'm a bit taken aback, but I avoid eye contact and try the next room. In the next bedroom is loads of people sitting and standing, just talking. As I walk into the room further, I get shouted at by a guy telling me I'm not letting it out. Then I'm whacked in the face by the strongest smell of weed. I walk straight back out after doing a quick scan and still not being able to see her. I then try the bathroom on the landing and it's another group of girls chatting and giving life advice. After telling them that Craig ain't shit and he doesn't care about you and them telling me that they don't know a Tessa, I leave to try my luck somewhere else. I'm feeling pretty lost. I can't leave because I've been drinking, and I was supposed to be staying over that night. I go back downstairs and into the back bedroom, just off the extension. I open the door to the room that I should be staying in that night, with all my stuff in, and it's dark and quiet. I sit on my bed, get my phone out, and start texting my boyfriend about how I wish I hadn't come and how I don't want to be there. As I'm looking at my phone, I hear the metal from a little tiny bolt scrape across the floor. I can't see the other side of the room, so I lock my phone to see better and can't make out the shapes. Then I hear a guy's voice. Sorry, I just didn't want anyone else coming in. That did not put me at ease. I awkwardly laugh and try to undo the lock to get back out and quickly slip through the door. I finally get to the kitchen and there's a girl slumped on the floor with her head down, murmuring to herself. I can't look away and just want to know she's okay, so I reach down to hold her hand and ask if she wants to go sit on the sofa. A guy stood next to her, drinking Jack straight from the bottle, tells me she don't need to go. Leave her. She's coming down and just needs a little pick-me-up, don't you, babe? As he passed her a cup from the counter with a pinkish-looking liquid inside, everyone is looking at me, so I just squeeze past to get to the garden, which is where I found her. Three guys stood over her, and she's passed out on the grass. They're taking pictures. I get this horrible lump in my throat when I see all the vomit of the patio steps and three guys laughing. Instinct kicks in and I run to her, sitting her up so she doesn't choke. The guys all laugh at her, shouting, Tessa, baby, look at the camera. Tessa, ha, <laughs> you're gonna love this. I don't know how she knew them, but I didn't and I was so mad. She snapped back to reality and told me that she just felt a bit tired so she had a quick power nap. 
After sobering up to that, I slept in my car in fear of the strange guy locked in my room, the girls in the bedroom doing coke, the girl in the kitchen passed out from who knows what, and in fear of being there if the police came. It was selfish, but I stayed until I knew my friend was in bed with other girls around her. I just couldn't be there in that house. This isn't an entirely too creepy story, but it is one that freaked me out. For context, I live in a university-owned dorm about a mile from main campus, and they have a shuttle service that takes you to and from campus and this particular dorm. I got together with some friends on Labor Day for a barbecue and had a little too much to drink. I was still pretty coherent, but it would be obvious to anyone that I wasn't totally with it. Around 10.30pm, my friend walked me to the shuttle stop and waited for me to get on before heading back to her dorm. As I was on the shuttle, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, but there were about four other people on the shuttle, so I assumed I was just being paranoid as well as drunk. However, that changed when I noticed a guy who was in his 20s sitting on the other side of the bus about two seats ahead of me who kept looking at me. I was uncomfortable but ignored it because I would be home and in my dorm soon. The shuttle drops us off and we all get into the elevator, myself first and the guy second. I push the button for my floor and he looks but doesn't press a number, which freaks me out, but I'm still hoping for the best and tell myself he just lives on the same floor. Of course, the other two people in the elevator get off before myself and this guy, and my dorm is the last room on my floor. We both get off on my floor, and I start walking. I look back, and he's deadlocked on me, so I start to panic and walk faster, and so does he. Finally, I pulled my keycard out and practically sprinted to my door as he also began to sprint. I got in and slammed the door behind me and locked it. After giving myself a minute, I look out the peephole and he's sitting across the hall from my door, just staring at my door. He did this for a good 7-10 to 10 minutes before muttering something to himself and leaving. I ended up calling one of my male friends to come over to my room and make sure he wasn't still lurking in the hall somewhere. Again, not entirely too creepy or exciting, but definitely scary at night, alone. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that. If you have a scary story you would like me to read in an upcoming video, this is one way to help me guarantee variety in the stories I share you can email me or post it to my subreddit. I'll drop the details in the video description. Thank you all for listening, and a special thanks to my patrons and channel members who now have early access to ad-free videos as well as other behind-the-scenes content. Thank you to Michael O'Malley, Marissa, Kuro, Ember Hops, King Slim, Justin Beast Gillespie, Joy Dana, Jay Bardle, Anissa, Stephanie McLaren, Lumini Kami, Skin Crawler, Adiara, Bella Plays 2006, Michelle Welchman, Dana B, Lisa McDonald, Clarice Scott, Madison C, Wasp Sting, Jennifer J, Ashley, Lilypad, Lee, Taya, Wyatt, Gina, Laura, JK06, Fenrizio, Donna, Joey, Big GSC, Tanya, Spaghetti Yolo King, Matthew, October Gypsy, Lisa, Ali, Thomas, Build With Me, Leticia, Fran, Debs, Insomnicats, Stephanie, Summer, Rebecca, Tyra, This Bad Kitty, Your Pappy's Dilly, Laney, 
tripping balls through history. Samantha, Erica, Alyssa, Tracy, Killian's Place, April, James Arterburn, Jen, Joy, Handout, Pegasus Genesis, Karen Keating, V. Berry, LJ, Fiona X. Fox, Scott, I Like Booty, Monica Level Ace, Chris and Donna, Holly Spry, Kimber, Jasmine, Sanatix, Heather Haven, Kitty Cat Luna 2, ADHD Aurora, Janice, Cinderella Baby, Borderline Betty, Lady Dracoid, Erica Nicole, Snowball Rathena, Melanie, The Honeybee 987, Pretty Girl 215, Ryan, Brooke, Wendy, Crafty Cow, Tina, Dina, Vampy Debs, Patricia, Amber, Krista, Brenda, Absinthe Alice, Christy, Kay, Spider's Web, Ooh La La Andrea, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Emma Lisa, Sigma Cube X, Greg, Chelsea, Amanda Jane, Sam, Zeb Tepe, Sarah C, Austin, Tegan, Lil Smart, Jenny, Gabrielle, Fire 05, Sarah P, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Monica Level Ace, and Alex. I hope you're doing well, guys. I'll see you all on the next one.